This time it's five superbikes from the 70s with three cylinder engines. The 1970s was truly the era when the superbike came to the fore. There had been superbikes before, but now there was a plethora of manufacturers building machines that we would definitely categorise as superbikes. So for this video we're looking at five superbikes with three cylinder motors. BSA Rocket 3 and the Triumph Trident T160. BSA Rocket 3, along with its Triumph Trident T150 stablemate, were both released in 1968, and they both feature a three cylinder overhead valve 740cc engine. Although, in the case of the BSA, the engine featured cylinders that were canted forward slightly, and not the whole engine tilted forward, as some publications sometimes suggest. The cylinders had a bore stroke of 67 by 70, the same dimensions incidentally as BSA's 250 Starfire. But apart from that this was basically a Triumph engine, external pushrod tubes and all. The crankshaft was formed at the BSA foundry and featured 120 degree spacings, as opposed to the 180 degree spacings that you find on the early Jotas. This was done because Bert Hotwood and Doug Heal who designed the machine believed that it would offer the best compromise of smoothness in a three cylinder unit. And in this they were proven essentially correct. The triple can hold motorway speeds with reasonable comfort and low levels of vibration, slightly more than you would find on a 4, but far less than a 360 parallel twin. But unfortunately the arrival of Honda 754 really dented the sales of the BSA and the Triumph. This was a ground up redesign and didn't use compromised parts from the twins in the way that the triples did. And of course the Honda featured all the bells and whistles, electric start, a fifth gear, and disc brakes right from the get-go, unlike the Triumph and the BSA. Because just as today, bikers do like the odd gadget. The collapse of BSA in 73 would see the end of the Rocket 3, and unfortunately the X75 prototype which Vetter had been working on, although this design was then handed over to the Triumph name, although actually the engines used were the last of the line Rocket 3 motors. November 74 would see the introduction of the Triumph T160, the last of the Tridents. And this motor would feature the angled cylinders of the BSA, so in effect it was actually the Rocket Gold Star motor, but with Triumph bits and pieces on it. This was then inserted into an all new frame, which is based on the Slippery Sam Racer, what was to prove to be the Smalley factory's last throw of the dice. The T160 was not a sales success, the industry having moved on by then, and a large version of the T160 would never see production, and the last T160 would roll off Smalley's production line at the end of 1975. And this very last machine, at least temporarily, was badged as a BSA. And a final gesture from the workers who would be out of work the following morning. The Laverda Jota. In 1973, Laverda introduced their 85 horsepower. 1000cc 3 cylinder 3C model. Slater Brothers, who were the UK importers, thought that there was great potential in this machine as a sportster, so they set about developing a more potent version with high lift cams, high compression pistons, and a less restrictive exhaust. The result was the Jota, after a Spanish dance, of course, in triple time. So impressed with the factory that they put the bike into serious production in 1976. And when Superbike magazine tested the bike in 77, they found it gave a top speed of just over 137 miles an hour, making it the fastest bike yet tested. The machine was powered by a 981cc air-cooled inline triple, with two valves per cylinder, wet sump lubrication, and a very unusual 180 degree crank spacing, which gave the machine its very characteristic exhaust note. The bike was sold in Australia, the UK, South Africa and New Zealand, in that slate above a state of tune, high compression pistons, high lift cams and all. However, in territories with tighter emission controls, 
the Jota was sold in a milder state of tune, minus those high left cans and with flat low compression pistons. So essentially it was a 3C model, but with Jota set of cloves. During its production run in the 1970s, the bike was largely unchanged. But 1981 would see a move to electronic ignition to simplify the timing system. And in 1982, the engine would move to 120 degree crank, as used on Yamaha's XS750 and of course the Triumph Tridents. And this, as intended, did result in a smoother, more civilised motor, but the characteristic engine notes of the original Jota was gone. This was a fact much lamented by Jota enthusiasts. So while the 120 was in many ways superior to the earlier model, it remains much less popular than the original 180 models. As a footnote, I know as a Spanish dance it's probably called the Jota, but I doubt any Englishman has ever called the bike anything other than a Jota. Suzuki GT 750 Suzuki's GT 750 probably has more nicknames than any other bike in history. Water Kettle, Water Buffalo, Water Carrier, in the UK it was simply called the Kettle. Because it boiled water, obviously. Now Suzuki launched their all new GT 750 in 1971 and it featured, fairly obviously, water cooling. Not something that was commonly featured on two strokes very often at that time. There had of course been Scots in prehistory and a few Villiers motors incorporated it back in the 1930s, but in the 70s it was a rare thing indeed. The engine was a 739cc two stroke with piston ported induction and a boring stroke of 70 by 64. The engine had a five speed gearbox and produced a fairly healthy 67 horsepower in its original trim which was handy because the bike was fairly weighty at 550 pounds and really the model had no pretensions of being a race bike it was essentially marketed as a GT or Gran Turismo but despite this the machine was marketed as the Le Mans initially at least in America and Canada the early 72 bikes featured drum brakes the later 73 to 75 models boasted disc brakes and slightly retuned engine to give 70 horsepower. The machine boasted a wide comfortable seat and could cover big distances very comfortably, although the chassis and handling were in no way up to the standards of the European opposition. The bike sold in reasonable numbers and had very much a cult following, but the fuel crisis of the early 70s very much dented the sales of these larger capacity gas guzzling two strokes. And then emission regulations becoming increasingly more stringent in the late 70s brought an end to production of such bikes. The GT going out of production in 1977. The Yamaha XS750. The Yamaha XS750 was released in 1976, initially at least to rave reviews, being voted Machine of the Year by Motorcycle News in the UK ousting Kawasaki's mighty Z1, being the winner for the last four years. The XS use a four-stroke, three-cylinder air-cooled unit with direct overhead cams and five-speed transmission by a shaft to the back wheel. The engine claimed 64 horsepower and handling was very typical for Japanese bikes of the day, so pretty average. The bike had a number of advantages. There was that convenience of shaft drive and the fresh modern styling. The first export models, the D-series, arrived in Europe in 1976. These would employ, slightly problematically, points ignition, because as Trident owners know, that middle cylinder can get awfully hot, leading to mechanical disaster. But a bigger and more common problem was that when under load, the bike had a habit of jumping into neutral from second gear, and these and some other mechanical issues would damage the bike's reputation in the eyes of the bike buying public. Yamaha moved quickly to release the 2D, a second generation model. This had a revised exhaust system, an improved gearbox and an electronic regulator rectifier to help cure some of the early electrical woes. So the machine did recover somewhat, and Yamaha felt able to upgrade the machine further in 1978 with a mild engine retune now being able to rev to 9000 rpm and an electronic ignition system to greatly simplify maintenance and further boost reliability. And so the engine would remain largely unchanged until 1980 when it was bored out to 826 cc's to create the GS850, but that's another decade and another story. The Kawasaki H2750 
During the 70s, Kawasaki were best known for producing three-cylinder two-strokes, some of which, like the baby in the range, the KH250, would survive into the 1980s. However, their bigger brothers would not be so lucky. Kawasaki would release the H2, also known as the Mach 4, in 1971, and was seen as very much an upgrade from the earlier Mach 3 500cc model. This machine had gained a reputation as something of a widow maker because of its aggressive power characteristics matched with an evil handling chassis. And although still no pussycat, the 750 was definitely more user friendly than the earlier 500 had been. And the chassis was a considerable improvement too, although never a great handler, at least it was moderately safe. So if he took the bike into a corner, he had at least a reasonable chance of coming out the other side. The bike caused a sensation when on release, it did the standing quarter mile in 12 seconds. Although nobody actually mentioned it at the time, the Norton Combat had done the same time two years earlier. Still mighty quick though. And with that modern lubrication system, the Kawasaki was likely to be more reliable than the old Commando. The H2 used a 748cc oil-injected, air-cooled, three-cylinder transverse triple had a bore stroke of 71 by 63 and a compression ratio of 7.3 to 1. Kawasaki claimed 74 horsepower, although it's not known what it actually got at the back wheel, at 6,800 RPM for a top speed of around 120 miles an hour. Although surprisingly given the performance, braking was a fairly modest single disc at the front with a second disc available as an option only and a drum at the back. 74 would see the 2B model. This had a mild detune down to 71 horsepower at 6,800 RPM claimed, as well as an improved injection system for the oil lubrication. And in fact, all round, the machine was made more user friendly and more reliable. But unfortunately, tightening emission regulations and the fuel crash of the early 70s meant that that was it for the Kawasaki H2. And the machine was withdrawn from service in 1975 after just three years of production. What collections of bikes would you like to see us do a video on? Maybe you've got a bike we can use for a test ride. Either way, get in touch below. Hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching.